Hello everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna look at how to design a flyback converter. Before we get into designing a flyback converter, we're gonna actually tear open one of the power supplies over here and we're gonna take a look at why we sometimes need a flyback converter compared to some other power converter options that are out there. So let's get into it. So a flyback converter is a type of isolated DC-DC converter that is commonly used in power supplies. There are other types of power converters that are used in power supplies, but it is common to find one in a power supply, particularly one like this bench power supply. So this power supply brings in AC through a standard plug, steps it down to DC, and then of course that DC is adjustable. One thing that you'll notice here with this particular power supply is that we have two different transformers in here. And it looks like we have a third transformer right here, but this is actually a common mode choke. So what happens in this converter is power comes in, goes through the switch, comes through the common mode choke, and then gets rectified. Part of that then gets distributed over to one of these transformers. The other transformer receives the standard 110 volt line voltage coming in from the plug. So it bypasses that rectifier and comes straight over here to this transformer. So one of these transformers is switching constantly, and there's a specific controller that switches that voltage on and off. And by pulling current pulses into this transformer, it's then gonna generate a DC voltage on the output. So the difference between a standard buck converter and a standard flyback converter is two major things. First of all, the flyback converter can be isolated very easily, and it's inherently isolated. And in fact, if you just look at the back side of this board, you can actually see here that they've drawn out the boundary and partially routed the boundary on this board to indicate where the isolation boundary sits. So one side of this is gonna be all AC input as well as rectified DC at high voltage, and then the other side is gonna be our low voltage levels coming off of these two transformers. Now, the way the flyback portion of this works is it's switching on the primary side of this transformer. So it's taking a very high voltage DC input and switching it constantly to then produce a steady DC output. Now, as you can imagine, just like the buck converter, the buck converter and the flyback converter both exploit the duty cycle of that switching element in order to control the output voltage. You can then have a feedback loop that then dynamically adjusts that duty cycle on the switcher, and then that will allow you to compensate for any voltage spikes or voltage droop on the output. So that's how these controllers work. And like I said, it's common to see these in some bench power supplies. Now that we know what we're looking at, let's hop over to the board and we can see how we can design one of these circuits for a power supply just like this. So the typical topology used in a flyback converter is pretty simple. We have a DC input, we have a ground terminal of course, and this DC input is being brought over to a transformer. Here I'm just going to leave a polarity marking for the moment. Now this transformer is being switched with a transistor. We are then going to modulate that transistor switching with a PWM signal. PWM signal has some duty cycle, which will write D. Then here on the output side, we have our secondary coil on our transformer. And then we have a diode for rectification. And then we have a capacitor here. And then we take the output to be the terminals across this capacitor. So in this topology, we typically will also see a snubber circuit here that consists of a diode that is then in series with a parallel RC circuit. So this is about as simple as it can get for a power converter. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven components that you need to build this converter. Now, of course, real flyback converters can get a little bit more complex. Instead, you could have an AC input instead of a DC input. And if you have an AC input, you would then need to go into a bridge rectifier. And the bridge rectifier would then, of course, convert this to a DC input. So I'm just gonna draw out my bridge rectifier here. So you would have a ground over here, which is then isolated from this ground on the output. And then, of course, I would have my 
AC input, which essentially comes over like this over to my bridge rectifier. So we can have an AC input bridge rectifier. This is gonna be a high DC voltage. And this high DC voltage, which is of course rippling, has some filtration that you want to apply here, is then being modulated with this transistor. So typically we'll, we will also have an LPF here, which could be some large capacitors, could be a Pi filter, whatever you need to do to bring down the ripple on this DC voltage. Then what you're doing here with this PWM switching signal is you are drawing in pulses of current into this primary coil in this transformer. Now, as you draw in pulses of current in this primary coil, you will of course have some capacitance in the MOSFET, and then you will have some inductances along this path. And the capacitance and the inductance together create some ripple on that switching signal. So that's why we have this snubber here. The snubber here is meant to reduce any of that ripple that, is, that would normally appear on the switching waveform that's being drawn into this transistor. So as this PWM signal modulates this uh, transistor on and off, it's drawing in these pulses of current into the primary side of the transformer. So we can call those primary pulses I sub P. Now that is going to induce a pulse on the output, I sub S, on the secondary side, which then points up this direction. So this is why we have the diode here. It is of course meant to rectify any current that is being drawn into this coil and then send it over to the output. That will then charge up this output capacitor and then that will give us our output voltage. Typically you will see a bank of capacitors here. You may see a bank of capacitors here and that's one of the reasons that we had all of those capacitors that were shown in that power supply. So this should illustrate one of the big advantages of using a flyback converter versus something like a buck converter. If we wanted to do a buck converter to bring in AC and then convert that down to, let's say, logic level DC, what we would have to do is first bring that AC voltage down to a manageable level with a transformer. And then we would have to put it through the bridge rectifier. And then we would have to then give it to our buck converter. With a flyback converter, we're taking the AC directly and we're pulling that high AC voltage through this transformer and converting it down to the desired voltage using the turns ratio of this transformer. So it's, a, it's similar, but it's a bit different. The part that's different here is that in a buck converter, this switching element would be on the output side, whereas in a flyback converter, this switching element is on the input side and it's running at higher voltage. So in a flyback converter, your challenge here is to design this output voltage, V sub out, based on the turns ratio here and the available duty cycle in this converter. So now let's look at some of the basic equations that we need to size the transformer and the inductances for our flyback converter. So first thing we need to know is a range of duty cycles for our switcher, which is going to range from D min to D max. Then the other thing that we need to know is what is our range of input voltages? Well, typically if you're dealing like with something coming off of an AC line in the United States, then the rectified voltage that's coming into the converter will be specified as something like 85 to 265 volts. So this is the range of voltages that would be seen on the top side of that primary coil. Now, using this data, we can then look at what happens at the output side and then size this turns ratio on our transformer. And so remember, it's this turns ratio on the transformer that we need to size so that we step down the voltage to the right level. So here on the primary side, we have NP. Here on the secondary side, we have NS. Now let's look at what else is happening here on the secondary side. We actually have some voltage that's gonna be dropped across this diode. So this voltage drop needs to be taken into account. And then here on our capacitor, we then have our output voltage that we actually deliver to our load components, V out. So the voltage that you're inducing in the secondary coil is not V out, it's actually VD plus the output voltage that you want to hit. So you need to account for the diode voltage in the design here. Diode voltage could be anywhere from 0.3 to 
0.7 is going to be for silicon, 0.3 is going to be for germanium diodes. So in any case, you are going to have some diode voltage that you need to take into account here. So what you're doing is you're sizing this turns ratio to hit a particular Vs, and then based on the diode voltage, you'll hit your target V out. So the next thing to realize is that in this section with the transistor, this transistor is going to have some particular time where that PWM signal drives it on and off. And it's that on and off action that is then going to modulate the input voltage here, V in, to a particular value. The secondary voltage that gets induced over on the secondary coil, Vs, is going to be equal to this input voltage multiplied by this quantity, multiplied then again by the inverse of this turns ratio. So this is going to be your secondary voltage that gets induced onto this side of the transformer. So here what we've done is we've basically taken the input voltage and we've stepped it down based on the duty cycle. And then that is also stepped down again through the turns ratio in the transformer. And that's how we get to this secondary voltage. Then of course we just subtract our voltage drop across the diode and then we get V out. Now the next thing I wanna talk about is what we have to do in order to get multiple rails coming off of this. Now that's another advantage of a flyback converter is that I can have a single transformer that generates multiple rails. So I'd have NP over here, but then what I can do is I can have actually multiple NSs. So I can have multiple secondary coils. So this coil could have one rail and it would have one diode here, one capacitor here. And then we could have another secondary coil coming off of this transformer. Make sure to keep track of the polarities of on, on this. It can have a diode and then it has its own capacitor and then it has a different output here. So you'd have a single duty cycle that is pulling current into the primary side, but the turns ratio between NS1, NS2, and NP will then determine the various voltage outputs here. So we'd have V out one and then we would have V out two. So you can extend this to basically as many rails as you like, uh, up to, of course, the physical limits or space limitation for your particular transformer. So that's one of the nice things about a flyback converter is I can basically set as many standard voltages as I want just by having these multiple coils on this transformer. So for example, I could have you know a 12 volt output here, I could have 3V3 here, and I could have another one at five volts. So this is another reason that these are very common is I can actually generate multiples of these standard voltage levels all with a single converter just by fixing these uh, transformer coil ratios. Now one thing that's important about this when you have a feedback loop is of course which one of these do we want to use for our feedback loop because typically you're going to have this transformer here with the transistor on the bottom side and you're going to have this PWM signal here but there will be an error amplifier connected to a feedback pin that then modulates the duty cycle of this PWM signal based on what the output of one of these rails is. So there's no hard and fast rule as far as which rail you need to choose, but you should choose one of them. And so basically you'll come off of one of these rails, uh, you'll probably go into an optocoupler, and then with an optocoupler, you can come back to the primary side, assuming that this is an isolated converter. This is another advantage of the flyback converter. With a flyback converter, I can have a whole bunch of totally isolated uh, ground regions in this converter. So I could, let's say, have uh, ground number one. This could be ground number two, and so on and so forth for all of my rails. So all of these different rails can be totally isolated if that's how I really want to build my system. I could also just set these to the exact same net if I wanted to. So I could have all of my secondary stuff hooked together and none of this would be isolated, but I could make all of this stuff isolated from the primary side, which has a totally different ground net. So this makes it very easy to isolate all of these different rails in your system. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to check the links in the description for more resources that will show you how to design a flyback converter for your PCB. 
Make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And of course, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah. <laughs>